A series of lectures by Professor George Phillies, based on his book, Elementary Lectures in Statistical Mechanics. And stand by for our future lecture series including Introduction to Mechanics, Harmonic Oscillators, Polymer Solution Dynamics, and Game Design. Chapter 2, Statistics. This chapter considers the need for averaging, the nature of averages, time and ensemble averages, the importance of statistical weight, and the notion of the ideal average. Our first and simplest question is why we need to do averaging. What are the statistical random issues that arise, and why do these issues show up with physical systems? The next few slides show why you need to do averaging in statistical mechanics. What you see here is a wall, the vertical line, and several atoms, the little circles. There is a wall atom potential energy. If you knew exactly where the atoms were, you could use the potential energy surface to calculate the force that those atoms are putting on the wall. Here is a representative potential energy surface between the atom and the wall, showing the potential energy becomes very large at small distances and then drops off. The force is determined by the slope of the potential energy curve. In this case, in some distances, the atoms are repelled by the wall, and in other distances, the atoms are attracted by the wall. The force exerted on the wall by the atoms, the pressure, is more complicated than it looks because the atoms are moving, as shown in this picture. As the atoms move, the force that each atom exerts on the wall changes, and therefore the total pressure fluctuates in time. As a result of the atomic motions, the pressure on the wall fluctuates. I have shown here a plot of pressure as a function of time displaying this fact. The question then is, little issue, the thermodynamic pressure does not fluctuate, it's a constant. So which of those values of P as a function of T do you choose to be the thermodynamic pressure? One answer is to choose the simple average. Another answer is to choose the mean square average. And a very successful treatment of thermodynamics and statistical mechanics assumes that the correct value of the pressure is the most likely value of the pressure. As a practical matter, pressure fluctuations are small, and therefore it doesn't matter a great deal which average you choose. A slightly different example of an averaging process is provided by this figure. The objective is to determine the concentration of atoms, the little diamonds, inside a large volume of liquid. What is done is to go in, take a small sample of the liquid, and count the number of diamond objects in the small sample. Historically, this process was used to determine the content of blood, namely the counts of white blood cells. It actually works. However, if you take several samples and count the number of diamonds in each sample, you will get different answers. One way to eliminate the fluctuations in the number of diamonds you see is to make the same measurement many times on different small samples and then take an average over all of the samples. This sort of averaging process is known as an ensemble average and that is what we will be doing in most of statistical mechanics. The important issue to keep in mind from this discussion is that because we have atoms and the atoms move, the quantities we measure fluctuate in time. To make those fluctuations go away so the quantities that we measure resemble the thermodynamic quantities, we have to do some sort of average, such as a time or ensemble average. Well, that's fine, but what do we mean by the word average? And that's the next part of this discussion. We're now going to discuss what an average is. Of course, most of you have been exposed to averages since you were in fourth or sixth grade, since they're fine examples of long division. Nonetheless, what is actually built into an average is a bit more complicated, so we're going to look very carefully at what averaging is. 
The simplest sort of average says we have four numbers, P1, P2, P3, P4. Their average is the sum of their values divided by four, because there are four numbers being averaged. Here we have a more complex average familiar to every student. We have three exams. The grades were 90, 80, 37, each with weight 1. Homework, grade of 90, but worth half as much of an exam. And labs, grade 54, worth three quarters as much as an exam. So we compute the average as indicated. And what's that denominator? Well, the denominator is there because if the student got a 100 on everything, then it should turn out the average grade was 100. And the denominator makes that statement true. As a final example of averaging, let's consider rolling dice. We have a four-sided die whose rolls are 1, 2, 3, and 4. Each of those rolls sides is equally likely, so each side is given a statistical weight of 1. Because we have four sides, in order to calculate the average die roll, we divide by the sum of the four statistical weights, 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. That's the denominator. And that gives us the average die roll for a four-sided die. And now we're ready to look at the general formula for the average of a variable A. Here, J, the index, labels the possible outcomes, which side of the die comes up. The sum is over all possible outcomes. Wj, the statistical weight, is the importance of each outcome, each value of j. And a sub j is the value of the variable a when j comes up as the outcome. The denominator q, the normalizing factor, is simply the sum of the statistical weight. Suppose you wanted to calculate the pressure on the walls of a room. Well, you could use Newton's laws of motion. You know all the potential energies. Of course, to do that, you would have to integrate F equals MA for all Avogadro's number of atoms, gas atoms, in the room. And gee, that's an absurd number of coupled differential equations to be integrating. Then you'd no need to know where all of the atoms were at the same time, and there's no known method of measuring it. Having done that, if you could measure it, you'd need to store Avogadro's number of coordinates and momenta, and there aren't enough computers in the world to do that. Finally, you might realize, even if you could do this calculation, the room down the hall has completely different set of atoms, completely different set of positions, and the pressure is the same, so somehow most of the details of that calculation weren't doing it. So what do we do? A clue is provided by rolling a six-sided die. The natural statistical answer is to say the statistical weight, the likelihood of getting a one, is one-sixth. That's the ideal statistical weight. You could also say, we'll roll 60,000 times. We will get some number of rolls of one, say 9,861, and we'll make that statistical weight the 9,861. Of course, the normalizing factor, if we roll 60,000 times, is 60,000, so the two statistical weights are very close together. You should notice, however, that it's a whole lot more work to roll a die 60,000 times than to say the statistical weight is 1 sixth. There's a clue here. My next lecture shows how to do ideal averages in statistical mechanics namely the Gibbs Ensemble Averaging Method.